Why do we want to consider the topic of occult influences in the Watchtower? Well, the first reason is that it reveals a side of the Jehovah's Witness organization that isn't readily apparent. We have these nice-looking people in suits going up to doors and knocking on them with Bibles in their hands, and we may not realize, uh, the, certainly the homeowners, householders, don't realize what's coming to their door and what kind of tainting there has been. And secondly, if we can show them the truth about their organization, as I said a minute ago, that may go a long way toward opening their closed minds. What we know about Jehovah's Witnesses, all of us do know that. First of all, they consider themselves to be biblical Christians. Okay, this is hitting three clicks at a time. I don't know why. Uh, they consider themselves to be biblical Christians. In fact, they think of themselves as the only true Christians, the only ones who really follow Scripture. And they would really be shocked at any sort of suggestion that there was any kind of connection between their organization and the occult. And I don't want to create any false impressions here. As you people know, obviously, I'm not saying that the average Jehovah's Witness who goes around knocking on doors is somehow involved with the occult personally or that they're conducting satanic rituals down at the Kingdom Hall or anything like that. The average Jehovah's Witness, certainly when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I didn't know about any of these things that I'm going to talk about today. And I think that uh, the average Witness would be shocked if they knew all of what, what we're about to explore. However, the organization's leadership has, over the years, allowed their doctrines and practices to be tainted by the occult, and that's what we want to take a quick look at for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. A major point that we need to recognize about Jehovah's Witnesses is they divide the world into us and them. There's God's organization, and then there's Satan's organization. Here's a typical quote from the Watchtower of 2001. It was also discerned in the 1920s that there are two opposing organizations, Jehovah's and Satan's. The fight is on between them, and we will be on the winning side only if we keep in step with Jehovah's organization. So there's God's organization, there's Satan's organization. Here's another one uh, from the Revelation book, uh, the revised edition of 2006. It talks about the satanic air breathed by the world, the satanic thinking that per permeates every aspect of life outside Jehovah's organization. Uh, and so it, it really shows that, that everything that motivates mankind to support Satan in de defying Jehovah's sovereignty. So it really draws that dichotomy. There's us on the inside and there's Satan on the outside, and, and it's, just, it's just that clear in their minds. Uh, and this is a very current book. As I mentioned, this is the 2006 revision. So this is right up to the minute information uh, from the new uh, version of the Revelation book. All, all religion, all business, all politics, everything that's not them is from Satan. And they believe that God's organization, which they belong to, is the antithesis of the occult. The occult is from Satan. Uh, this is from the book Live with Jehovah's Day in Mind, which was also published in 2006. It says a true servant of Jehovah must shun occult practices. God never uses magic or the occult to reveal his will or to exercise his power. Dabbling in the occult can bring one under the influence and control of the leader of the demons, Satan who is a liar and whose strategy is to deceive people. So it's really a bad thing. They, don't, they believe that that's, there's just a, a hard, fast wall in between Jehovah's organization and anything that has to do with Satan, which makes it kind of ironic in a way that there's so much fear among Jehovah's Witnesses of demonic phenomena. There was an article that the Watchtower published, or a couple of articles that they published back in 1966, that stirred up a lot of this fear. It was on the topic of the attack of the wicked spirit forces. And it talked about these attacks that the demons would make against Jehovah's Witnesses. It talks about things like a physical attack, mental attack, a bodily blow, a slap in the face, a throwing of one to the ground, bodily illness and pain, doctors being unable to find a cause. One may be disturbed while trying to sleep due to the prevalence of abnormal noises in the house, a tugging of bed covers, shaking of the bed, an apparition like a face, a pair of vicious eyes, often a voice is heard that harasses and terrorizes. The voice usually suggests or commands a certain course of action, which if followed can lead to spiritual collapse, violence, insanity, or suicide. Well, what do you do if you're having these problems? The same article said, same magazine said, um, one under demon attack should calmly, not in hysteria, now imagine all this stuff's happening to you, but you should calmly <laughs> investigate your house and your household articles. In some few cases, the house may be the cause of the trouble, and the best thing to do is move out. Some demons delight in haunting a place. 
But if a house has a clean history, instead of moving out, investigate objects in the house. If you at one time practiced black magic or witchcraft or other forms of spiritism, did you burn up all articles relating to demonism upon learning of God's truth? It even goes on to say, uh, talk about accepting gifts from relatives or persons who have dabbled in spiritism. Any kind of article from such a person can cause trouble. Uh, a radio, a sewing machine, a pair of shoes, a jewelry, a good luck charm, a bathrobe, a blanket, a book. One woman had her bed tipped up at night when she tried to sleep on a mattress given to her by her spiritualist mother. A young woman had a fever of 106 degrees when wearing a garment given her by a spiritualist. We're not talking here about just getting rid of crystal balls and tarot cards and Ouija boards and things like that, even innocent items. Uh, jewelry, jewelry, shoes, books, and so forth. Uh, if there's a possibility that someone who owned it at one time might have had an association with the occult, then those things can bring demons into your house. Um, I knew of a situation, uh, of course, that witnesses won't go to yard sales, thrift stores, and so forth. They're very cautious about those things, as we know. I had a situation once where I picked up a copy of one of the organization books, the Organized to Accomplish Our Ministry, or one of those, or one of the various ones they've had, at a used bookstore. And the witness who was with me was very upset about that, saying, why would that book be in a used bookstore? It must have been somebody who became apostate that, that sold it to the used bookstore, and therefore you might bring a demon into the house, into your house, by having this book that might have come from an apostate, uh, that even though it's a book that came from God's organization. So there's a tremendous amount of fear. Uh, another Christian woman kept a handbag given her by an aunt who was a fortune teller. Sometime keeping a letter from a spiritistic relative has brought trouble. Some persons have reported uh, gaining relief by burning letters from persons who dabbled in spiritism. So if your mother has a Ouija board, you may want to burn any letters that she writes you, or, or you, know, you might find you're having trouble in your house. Now, can somebody tell me where in the scriptures it says that Satan works against believers by jumping out from behind things and yelling boo? I can't find that in the Bible. I can't find in the Bible where it says that demons are shown to inhabit inanimate objects and can be transferred from place to place by moving those objects around. I, I can find that in the voodoo religion. I can find it in certain ancient animistic beliefs. I can't find it in Christianity. I can't find it in the Bible. But there's real paranoia on this matter among, uh, among many of Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, you guys know every congregation has a few stories, right? Anybody here been in a congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses that didn't have stories like that? And it leads me to a question. My question is, are the demons stupid or what? I was a Jehovah's Witness for 30 years. And I, some of you were in even longer than I was. Some of you maybe not quite as long. Has anybody here ever known a Jehovah's Witness whose faith was damaged by having the demons supposedly attack them? Did anybody ever leave the organization so that the demons would leave them alone? I never did. In every case that I knew of or ever heard of, Jehovah's Witnesses who thought they were under demon attack became stronger witnesses. They got closer to the organization. They started to do more. They prayed more. They did whatever, whatever the organization told them to do. Now, if Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth, if they're God's organization, why would the demons carry out these attacks knowing that they're just going to make the person a stronger witness most of the time? Are the demons stupid? Why would they act against their own interests like that? If the demons really are involved in these attacks, and I'm not sure in many cases that they are, I think in a lot of cases it's just uh, the person's own imagination fueled by the things that the watchtower has told them about demon attacks, but if the demons really are involved in these attacks, there's a more sinister possibility. They want to make the person a stronger witness. They want to drive him closer to the organization because they want to eliminate the possibility that he'll be willing to listen to the real truth about the real Jesus. Well, to really get some understanding of these uh, attitudes that Jehovah's Witnesses have, we have to go back to their earliest history. You all know this guy, our good friend Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and the founder also of the uh, Watchtower magazine. Russell is portrayed by Jehovah's Witnesses today as a sincere Bible student who just uh, poured over the scriptures and was used by God to start a great work. Actually, Russell was a syncretist. He studied a whole different number of different uh, disciplines, different teachings. That's what a syncretist does. They take a little bit of this and a little bit of that teaching and a little bit of the other teaching and they kind of blend it all together into one set of beliefs that, that they can accept. 
And that's what he did. He studied science, he studied pseudoscience, he studied religions, he studied occultism. And in many cases, he just took ideas from all of these and blended their teachings, their ideas, with what he found in the Bible. This statement from the very first issue of, of Zion's Watchtower illustrates what I'm talking about. He said, a truth presented by Satan himself is just as true as a truth stated by God. Accept truth wherever you find it, no matter what it contradicts. You see, Russell's willingness and the willingness of his successors to combine other traditions and beliefs with the word of God have led to much error and, and deception over the years, and we're going to see that as we go along. As I said, he was the founder of the Watchtower Society. Well, the Watchtower itself is a symbol that has occult connections. If you don't believe that, if you're questioning that, go home and sit at your computer after, you're done with the, after we leave this convention and just Google the word Watchtower and see what you get. You'll get some hits on Jehovah's Witnesses. You might get a little Bob Dylan in there, Jimi Hendrix kind of thing, because they got that song all along the Watchtower. But mainly what you're going to get, or not mainly, but at least to some extent, what you're going to get is a number of references to magic and the occult, because the Watchtower is an image that's used in certain types of magical rituals. Uh, even in the tarot deck, there's a card called the Tower. But it gets even worse than that. In some forms of magical practice, the Watchtower is used as a symbol of power. Here's a, uh, a reference from the Wikipedia article on Watchtower magic. It says, in ceremonial magic and some traditions of Wicca and neo-paganism, the four cardinal points are believed to have spiritual guardians called watchtowers. Often believed to represent the four elements, the watchtowers are invoked during ritual to cast the magic circle. What's more interesting than that is what's represented by the watchtowers. In many Wicca and witchcraft systems, the watchtowers are evocational symbols of spiritual beings known as the Watchers or the Grigori. Who are the Grigori? Well, it's an unusual sounding name, and if we continue with Wikipedia, they have an article on the, Grig the Grigori as well. It says the Grigori are a group of fallen angels told of in biblical apocrypha who mated with mortal women, giving rise to a race of hybrids known as the Nephilim. Sound familiar? Who are described as giants in Genesis 6-4, also known as Watchers. The Grigori appear in the books of Enoch and Jubilees. Now, Enoch and Jubilees are not biblical books. They're apocryphal books from the Old Testament period. But what we find is that these Grigori are identified in apocryphal Jewish literature as the fallen angels who came to earth to mate with women prior to the flood. And we know what the Watchtower says about them. Watchtower of 2007 says the inspired scriptures tell us that sometime before the great flood of Noah's day, certain angels began to take an unusual interest in the women on earth. These unions were unnatural, and they produced hybrid offspring known as Nephilim. Ever since the wicked angels lost their original position, they have been the demon companions of Satan and have served his evil interests. So to recap, the watchtowers are symbol of the Gre Grigori, the Grigori are the fathers of the Nephilim, who the Watchtower magazine acknowledges to be fallen angels or demons. So the Watchtowers are symbols of the demons. Now, what do you think the reaction of the average Jehovah's Witness to that would be? <laughs> Russell's magnum opus was the six-volume set called Studies in the Scriptures, and the later editions of the volumes of this series bore the winged sun disc on the cover. It's funny, you know, Pat and I stopped at, a, there's a little bookstore we usually stop at on the way down here the day before, and we stopped there yesterday, and the first book I saw was a book on magic called The Power of the Winged Sun Disc, and it was a whole book of how that symbol, uh, the magic that can be done with it. It's a symbol originating in Assyria and Egypt. It's been used by a variety of groups, such as Freemasonry, Spiritists, Theosophy, the Rosicrucians, and, of course, the Bible students, or Jehovah's Witnesses. Getting a little more information on that uh, from the book Practical Egyptian Magic. Emblematic of the element of air, this consists of a circle or solar type disc enclosed by a pair of wings. In ritual magic, it is suspended over the altar in an easterly direction and used when invoking the protection and cooperation of the sylphs. And in another reference, in Wikipedia under the winged sun, the winged sun is a symbol sometimes known as Behadeti, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right associated with divinity, royalty, and power in the ancient Near East. In early Egyptian religion, the symbol represented Horus of Edfu. So it was a symbol in this one tradition of the Egyptian god Horus. 
In later times, in other cultures, it came to be identified uh, with other gods. The winged sun disk, according to about.com, is one of the oldest religious symbols on Earth, and invariably a solar symbol. The Assyrian winged disk represents the sun god Shamash, the Egyptian figure, the sun god Re. So different traditions use the same symbol, and yet all of them are using it for occult purposes. What went through Russell's mind to want to use this symbol, a pagan symbol that's symbolic of false gods, to decorate the cover of his book? Why would you put that there? It just makes no sense to me. There are a number of specific areas of the occult also where the watchtower has kind of become tainted, and I want to run through them one by one. The first one I want to talk about is phrenology. Now, phrenology comes from Greek words that mean mind and discourse, and this is kind of a funny one, too. It's, it's an occult science that endeavors to read a person's character from the shape, in particular, the peaks and valleys of the skull. And you can find out what a person's like by reading the bumps on his head and the shape of his skull. And it began in the late 17, early 1800s. Here's a quotation from the Golden Age in 1921, and it says, the size of the nose, as also the size of the eyes, is not without significance. The small-nosed man cannot have a judicial mind, whatever his other excellencies may be. And a man whose nose upturns can no more be expected to administer justice than a pug dog can be expected to act as a shepherd. So if you go to court and you have a case to be tried, you better hope you get the judge with the big nose. Because otherwise, you're not going to get justice, according to this. Here's another one from the Watchtower of 1915. It says, man's head is shaped differently. Therefore, he can think of subjects about which the lower animals cannot think. A man with a head of a given shape cannot think with the same breadth of mind as a man with a better shaped head. A man who is less fallen. Some have lost more, others less of the original perfection, of the original intelligence given man in his creation. So again, according to the shape of your head, you might be more or less fallen. So I guess that means there's less work for Jesus to do to take away your sins, right? If, if you're less fallen, then uh, that means you're not quite as bad as the other guys. The shape of your head, again, is an indicator. Uh, well, we know what happens with Jehovah's Witnesses when they have teachings like this. They get new light. And the Watchtower got new light. Uh, the Watchtower of 1978 says some false beliefs have been removed, such as phrenology, the study of character traits by feeling bumps on the head. The shape of the skull is not determined by the shape of the cerebrum, nor is it possible to assign character traits to specific areas of the brain. Okay, so they got over that one. That's one of those that you can point back at that and they can say, well, we've had new light since then. Jehovah's Organization has really progressed. Well, let's take a look at this one. Astrology. Jehovah's Witnesses are strongly opposed to astrology. They're even, you guys, as, you, as you people know, they're, they're told not to read the horoscope columns in the newspapers, right? Even that, which are really most of the time not even genuine, they're just something that somebody made up to publish in the paper, but they're afraid you'll get a demon from reading that. Well, here's a quotation from one of their publications in 1914. It says, No nation has ever claimed the invention of the Zodiac, though doubtless they would have been glad to have the honor had they invented it. The higher critics of today, though denying the inspiration of the scriptures, admit that there is a close and strange agreement between the Bible and the Zodiac. If, then, we find the divine plan written in these constellations, realizing that men could not have written a plan that they did not even understand, it would be only reasonable to ascribe its origin to God. Indeed, the same Bible which points to the Great Pyramid, we'll get to that in a minute, points also to the heavens as declaring the wonderful plan of salvation. Well, the heavens do declare the glory of God, but they don't declare the chronology and the specifics of the plan of salvation. They declare the glory of God because of his creation. So they're actually saying here that it's good to use the zodiac to explain God's plan of salvation, and they're regarding the zodiac, astrology, as a sign from God. There's another place where the stars kind of came into their early teaching, and that is, uh, that'll come up, there we go. They actually thought that the actual dwelling place of Jehovah was on a planet orbiting the star Alcyon in the Pleiades cluster. Zion's Watchtower of 1895 said, our solar system of planets is also found to be revolving together around some other great center, the group Pleiades, and the reasonable suggestion has been made, I don't know who would make that suggestion reasonably, that the center may be in the heavens, the highest heaven, the throne of God. So they're saying that the throne of God was in the Pleiades. Well, time went by, and of course, there was new light. 
A wake of 2000 is typical, although it was many years before that that they repudiate, repudiated astrology, but this is just exa an example of one uh, statement that they make, that astrology is one of the machinations of the devil, which he uses to control and influence people to serve his purpose. So it used to be a sign from God, now it's a machination of the devil. Thus it is hardly surprising that the Bible exhorts Christians to stand firm against Satan's clever devices, which included astrology. Next, we have the pyramids. The Bible students used to believe that God had ordained the construction of the Great Pyramid in order to illustrate his plan of salvation, especially the chronology of that plan. Uh, the book Thy Kingdom Come, which was the third volume of the Studies in the Scriptures series, in uh, the 1903 edition spoke of the testimony of God's stone witness, remember that phrase, and prophet, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The Great Pyramid seems in a remarkable manner to teach in harmony with all the prophets an outline of the plan of God past, present, and future. And they went on to explain exactly how it taught that. It was actually a matter of chronology. Uh, they would measure or claim they had measured certain passages within the pyramid, certain hallways, in effect, within the pyramid, and whatever the inches of the hallway were corresponded to a certain number of years. So, for example, the downward passage was, they said, 1,542 inches, and therefore they started with the year 1542 B.C., and then the, the entrance passage was 3,416 inches, which they added to the 1542, and that brought them to 1874. So you can see how reasonable it was for, for them to believe that uh, Christ returned then. Okay? Now, don't get confused by all this. I don't expect you to figure out the exact chronology. The important part is that the measurement of the pyramid, or the alleged measurement of the pyramid, was taken to pinpoint a certain year as the beginning of the biblical time of trouble. But watch what happened later on. If we compare the 1904 edition of the book with the 1910 edition in the book, what we find out is that since their chronology had changed, the pyramid grew by 41 inches. So I don't know if they went and remeasured it, and maybe that's why they changed the chronology or what, but uh, it just seems kind of obvious here that somebody was not being honest. Uh, they, they were using these inches to, to show how their chronology should uh, come out, and when the chronology changed, the pyramid got bigger. Well, time went by, and of course the day came when they got new light on the pyramids. Watchtower of 1928 says, if the pyramid is not mentioned in the Bible, then following its teachings is being led by vain philosophy and false science and not following after Christ. The Great Pyramid of Giza, as well as the other pyramids thereabout, also the Sphinx, were built by the rulers of Egypt and under the directions of Satan the devil. Then Satan put his knowledge in dead stone, which may be called Satan's Bible and not God's stone witness, which we read about earlier. So from God's stone witness to Satan's Bible. Talk about a 180, huh? Well, after Russell's time, along came our other friend, if you want to call him that, Judge Rutherford. He maneuvered his way into control of the Watchtower Society, and one of his big priorities in life was to gain control, not just control of the legal organization, but he really wanted to turn the hearts of the people to him from Russell. He wanted to be the object of their affections that Russell had been during his life. And in order to do that, he needed to establish his authority, and in order to establish his authority, he needed to come up with a new doctrine. He actually attributed the flow of information through God's organization to the angels communicating with the leadership of the group. And I have several quotations regarding that. Uh, this one is from the book Vindication, Volume 1. It talks about the officers of the Lord that are invisible to human eyes, that is the cherubim, seraphim, and angels. It says, these invisible ones the Lord uses to put in the hands of his faithful servant class the fiery message from his word, or judgments written. And then what do they do with it? It says that... Uh, the resolutions adopted by conventions of God's anointed people, booklets, magazines, and books published by them contain the message of God's truth and are from the Lord Jehovah and provided by him through Christ Jesus and his under officers. The, interp the interpretation of prophecy, therefore, is not from man, but is from the Lord, and the Lord causes events to come to pass in fulfillment of the prophecy in due time. Well, I missed a few on that one. So here's what's happening. The angels are getting the messages from God and they're delivering it to the faithful servant class and the faithful servant class is publishing it as resolutions, books, magazines, and books. And therefore, everything they publish is from the Lord Jehovah. Here's another quotation, Watchtower of 1935. Without a doubt, without a doubt, the Lord uses his angels to cause the truth to be published in the Watchtower. Certainly, God guides his covenant people by using the holy angels to convey his message to them. Uh, from the book Preparation, certain duties and kingdom interests have been committed by the Lord to his angels, which include the transmission of information to God's anointed people on the earth for their aid and comfort. Even though we cannot understand how the angels transmit this information, we know that they do it. Well, there's a problem, though. 
We know, we know, it said, that the angels are transmitting this information. There's a little problem. <laughs> they predicted Armageddon for uh, 1914, 1918, 1925, within a few months in 1941, 1975, within the 20th century, within the lifetimes of those who saw 1914, and my personal favorite, the one they still use, soon. Soon. Given this history of false prophecies that the organization has amassed, the, the operative question is, what should we believe? Were these prophecies really transmitted by angels to the remnant, as Rutherford taught? Well, there's two possibilities. No, they weren't, or yes, they were. If they weren't, then Rutherford wasn't telling the truth, and he was a liar and a fraud, and we shouldn't pay any attention to him or his organization. But if he was telling the truth, and if he did actually receive communication from angels, what kind of angels must they have been? in view of the unreliability of the message that was preached by the organization in that day. What kind of angels inspire false prophecies and inaccurate information? If Rutherford was guided by angels, if he really was, they couldn't have been the holy angels of God. They had to have been demonic spirits. But time went by, and we got some new light on angels. The Proclaimers book from 1993 says, those who make up the one true Christian organization today do not have angelic revelations or divine inspiration, but they do have the inspired holy scriptures which contain revelations of God's thinking and will. The only question I have, was it angels that gave them this new light, that it wasn't angels? That I, I don't know. <laughs> I was just wondering. We all know the reasoning from the scriptures book. It defines necromancy as the spiritistic practice of talking with the dead is actually a fraudulent deception that can put people in contact with the demons and often leads to a person's hearing unwanted voices and being harassed by those wicked spirits. So there's that fear being instilled again. However, when we look at their history, we find that there's been a little communication with the dead. The book The Finished Mystery of 1917 says this verse, Revelation 8.3, shows that though Pastor Russell has passed beyond the veil, he is still managing every feature of the harvest work. We hold that he supervises, by the Lord's arrangement, the work yet to be done. Hmm. Here's another one, Watchtower of 1917. Hence our dear pastor, now in glory, is without doubt manifesting a keen interest in the harvest work and is permitted by the Lord to exercise some strong influence thereon. So, necromancy today is defined as communication with the dead and a way to get in contact with the demons. Here it's saying that Pastor Russell, although he had died, was still managing the Lord's work. Can you have it both ways? Of course not, that's why they got new light. <laughs> the book Jehovah in 1934 says no one of the temple company would be so foolish, even though it was exactly what they had concluded in the past, no one would be so foolish as to conclude that some brother or brethren at one time amongst them and who has died and gone to heaven is now instructing the saints on earth and directing them as to their work. Well, there's another however. They still believe it. This is from the book Revelation, its grand climax at hand, again, and this is the 2006 revision, page 125. It says, it is fitting then that one of the 24 elders representing anointed ones already in heaven should stir John's thinking. Yes, that elder could locate the answer and give it to John. This suggests that resurrected ones of the 24 elders group may be involved in the communicating of divine truths today. This is an absolutely current publication. It was published in 1988. This is the revised version of 2006. It was just recently, I believe, studied in the congregation book studies. There's no new light on this topic. Jehovah's Witnesses still believe this, and the Watchtower still claims that their information currently is being supplied by faithful anointed Jehovah's Witnesses who have died and gone to heaven to be with Christ. This is a direct violation of the Bible's command not to have any form of communication with the dead. Well, I've talked quite a while now for several minutes. It's time for a pop quiz, and this quiz isn't going to be nearly as much fun with you guys as it is when I do it in a church, because you guys all know the answer. I have here a translation of the New Testament, and I want to read you John 1.1 1, 1 from it, and you can probably guess who it is. See? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. New World Translation, I heard something else. Reber, yes. Nobody ever guesses that when I do this at a church. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we know Jehovah's Witnesses have the New World Translation, uh, which has been rendered in such a way as to obscure the deity of Christ and to advance their other peculiar doctrines. You can imagine that a translation like that drew a lot of criticism from biblical scholars when it came out, and as a result, they've always kind of been on the outlook to find any kind of a scholar they could who would support their translations and endorse their renderings, and that's how 
this guy gets into the picture, Johannes Grieber. He was not a Jehovah's Witness. He was a former Catholic priest who produced a translation of the New Testament in 1937. The Watchtower used his renderings to support the New World Translation in 1962 and 1975. I guess it makes sense that if you were producing a bogus Bible translation, you would turn to somebody else who produced a bogus Bible translation and try to get support for your renderings, right? The real problem is in the source of Grieber's translation. This is from the foreword to his uh, New Testament. It says, the task was not simple. Many contradictions between what appears in the ancient scrolls and the New Testament, as we have grown to know it, arose and were the subject of his constant prayers for guidance. Prayers that were answered and the discrepancies clarified to him by God's spirit world. At times he was given the correct answers in large illuminated letters and words passing before his eyes. Other times he was given the correct answers during prayers, prayer meetings. His wife, a medium of God's spirit world, was often instrumental in conveying the correct answers from God's messengers to Pastor Grieber. Grieber received his translation from spirits, from angels. I wonder if those are the same angels that Rutherford was talking to. Do you think? I suspect they were. <laughs> I suspect they were. Now, in 1983, the Watchtower published a rejection of Grieber's translation. The questions from readers asked, why in recent years has the Watchtower not made use of the translation by the former Catholic priest Johannes Grieber? Uh, their answer in part was, this translation was used occasionally in support of renderings of Matthew 27, 52 and 53 and John 1, 1, as given in the New World Translation and other authoritative Bible versions. But as indicated in a foreword to the 1980 edition of the New Testament by Johannes Grieber, this translator relied on God's spirit world to clarify for him how he should translate difficult passages. The Watchtower has deemed it improper to make use of a translation that has such a close rapport with spiritism. Sounds fair enough to me, right? I mean, they, they didn't know about Grieber's occult associations, and when they found out, 1980, when the new edition came out of Grieber's translation, uh, they stopped citing his New Testament as an authority, right? <laughs> no? Yeah, they, they knew way back when. What did the Watchtower know and when did they know it? They, know, they knew way back in 1956 that Grieber was a spirit medium. Here's what they published then. It says Johannes Grieber in the introduction of his translation of the New Testament, copyrighted in 1937, I myself was a Catholic priest and until I was 48 years old had never as much as believed in the possibility of communicating with the world of God's spirits. The day came, however, when I involuntarily took my first step towards such communication and experienced things that shook me to the depths of my soul. My experiences are related in a book that has appeared in both German and English and bears the title Communication with the Spirit World, Its Laws and Its Purpose. In the foreword of his aforementioned book, ex-priest Grieber says, the most significant spiritualistic book is the Bible. Under this impression, Grieber endeavors to make his New Testament translation read very spiritualistic. So that's what they knew in 1956. And they knew that he had translated a spiritualistic New Testament. Why would they use it to bolster the accuracy of their own New Testament? Well, the answer is, truth was not a concern. What was a concern was making their organization and their translation look good. So just to quickly summarize that, in 1956, they knew he was a spiritualist and that his New Testament had an occult origin. Nonetheless, they used his renderings to support the New World Translation. Uh, without acknowledging his occult associations in 1962 and 75. And then in 1983, after being criticized for using such a translation, they pretended that they had just found out about Grieber's occultism and they stopped referring to his work as su for support. This next topic uh, that I want to cover is one that I've saved uh, toward the end because it's a little bit controversial. Back in the 1970s, Wilson Bryan Key stirred up some uh, public controversy with the publication of this book, which argued that advertisers were inserting messages into their uh, advertising photos that were perceived below the level of consciousness, that there were, in effect, hidden pictures in advertisements that stimulated fear, pleasure, sexual desire, or other emotions in the viewers without their ever realizing it. And these emotions were supposed to create a desire for the products that the advertisers were selling, uh, and again, the viewer was not supposed to really know what happened. Well, nobody ever thought of linking these techniques and, with the watchtower uh, until basically the 1980s and early 1990s. At that time, this book by Derek Barefoot was published. Barefoot claimed that some of the pictures in watchtower publications during the 1980s contained hidden images. 
Unlike the images in advertising that he had written about, however, uh, these images seemed like they were designed to evoke fear or terror in the readers, uh, negative emotions. Well, Barefoot pointed these out, and he was disfellowshipped for his trouble. And as I said earlier, the, the matter is very controversial. Some years ago, I spoke with Tom Cabine, uh, who had been the press room overseer at, at Bethel up until the Great Purge of 1980. And uh, at the time, he kind of expressed skepticism about these pictures. So it's not, it's not something that's clear. Now, you'd have to say, well, Tom left in 1980. Basically, the pictures started showing up after that. So I'm not sure. I, I don't want to really try to sway you guys either way. I have my own thoughts about it. But not, the point is that not everyone is a, in agreement about these images actually existing. So I thought we'd take a look at a few examples. Let's hope I can get these to go through right. Um, this is from the Revelation book. You probably all know this picture. You probably all know where I'm going with this, right? Everybody knows what we're going to see. Uh, there's something unusual about Jesus' hand in this picture. If we take a closer look, we find that there's what appears to be a face embedded in the palm of Jesus. Does anybody have something that looks like a face on the palm of their hand? That, you know, unless you have a magic marker with you or something. I mean, I don't have anything that looks like that on my hand. If anything, it would look like an abnormal growth, but it looks like a face. Why would the Watchtower artists draw Jesus in that way? Here's another example. An innocent picture of a man drinking from a skin of water, but there's something about his sleeve. It appears that there's a monstrous face. And if we look closely at the face, we find the word ja is formed by the teeth of the face. Ja, as any good Jehovah's Witness knows, is the shortened poetic form of the name Jehovah. Why would the monster in the man's sleeve have Jehovah's name in his teeth? What would motivate an artist to include this type of image? Now, this one may be the best known. There we go. Best known and probably the earliest of the hidden images that I'm aware of. In fact, it was this one, I believe, that started the rumors flying in the organization in the first place. Um, we have an image of some women here who are innocently out doing some street work and field service, but there's, once again, something going on in that lady's dress. Um, and if we take a closer look, it's a little harder to see when it's blown up big like this. It, it's fairly clear if you look at the picture actually in the magazine, but uh, it's, it's a little blowing it up like this seems to destroy some of the imagery. But I don't know if you can see the image of the face. Can you still see it right there from the, with, from the screen? Yeah. In fact, if we compare this face with the publication of a later watchtower, there's that one again, and there's what looks to me like the same guy. And that's a picture of a pagan god, as, as the article acknowledges, and uh, most, uh, most uh, sources say that it looks like Zeus, a well-known well image of Zeus. Why is Zeus in some lady's folds of her dress as she's going out in field service? Doesn't make sense. Over here, we have a picture of Jesus and his armies charging off to Armageddon to destroy all those non-Jehovah's Witnesses like us. And yet, there seems to be a curious cloud formation. If we take a closer look, we've got kind of the... Whoops, went too far there. Uh, we've got the A for Anarchy symbol. I don't know if you see that in there, but that's, I've seen that on walls, painted, spray-painted on walls and things like that. It's kind of on a sideways tilt. Uh, again, why is that particular formation in the clouds as Jesus and the armies are riding off to Armageddon? There were several pictures of Jesus also that, that seemed to show his hands in a strange position. This picture from the Greatest Man book uh, shows him blessing children, but there's something odd about his hand. I can't naturally hold my hand in that position. I have to force it that way. Maybe some of you are more flexible than me but I can't imagine why they would draw Jesus' hand in that sort of position. Here's another example. This is from the Watchtower of 1988. Same position. Now, Derek Barefoot argued that this particular position of the hand is a variation of the horned hand. You've probably seen the one that looks like this with the kids at the concerts, right? That's a horned hand. People don't like that because it's supposed to be a demon sign. Well, according to Barefoot, this is a different sign, a different version of the same thing. I see people out there in the audience. Everybody's trying it. Can I, can I do that? <laughs> I, I imagine some people are more flexible than others, but it seems kind of an odd position to draw his hand in. Again, there are a lot more examples that we could examine. Uh, we're getting a little bit short on time, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very controversial subject. Not everybody agrees uh, that the images are there. Not everybody thinks that they mean anything or that they're relevant or that they were inserted on purpose. 
I kind of gave you a little quick overview of examples to try to get you to make up your own mind on it. My thought is that it, it looks to me like there's something there that was deliberately inserted. That's my thought. Now, why? By whom? I don't know. What really disturbed me about these pictures, though, wasn't the fact that they were there. You know the rumor that was going around the Watchtower at the time, around the organization at the time, was that there had been an apostate or a Satanist or something like that in the Bethel Art Department and that they had found him and disfellowshipped him and he was the one that was inserting all these pictures. You, you, many of you probably heard that. Uh, and what bothered me was that they published this article on spreading rumors. They, the article denied that any images existed and then they started to disfellowship anybody who was persistent in saying that they saw the images or told other people about them or tried to make a case for them. It really shook me up that they were willing to take such extreme measures over this issue and it, it made me believe that they had something to cover up and even more to the point that God's organization was willing to lie about it in order to cover it up. That was a big, big step toward the door for me. Even though the images themselves I don't think are all that significant in the grand scheme of things, just knowing what their attitude toward it was really shook me up and really was a big, uh, a big step away. Speaking of uh, rumors going around the congregations, anybody remember these guys? <laughs> Back when the Smurfs were big on TV, there were rumors running rampant in the organization about their supposed demonic connections. Uh, allegedly, there were satanic messages in the cartoons, and even worse, Smurf toys were rumored to come alive and do unusual things like uh, biting and injuring children in some cases. There was one story I had heard about a rather messy child whose parents put uh, Smurf wallpaper in his room, and the kid's room was always messy, but all of a sudden, every morning, the room was nice and tidy, and the parents couldn't figure out what was going on. So one night, they decided to stay up and watch, and what they found was that the Smurfs were coming down off the wallpaper and cleaning up the room at night. <laughs> I can't figure out why these little demons wanted to do such a good deed for the kid. That's the, that's the part that really sticks with me. But the classic story about the Smurfs that I, probably a lot of you heard if you were in the organization then had to be the one about the little girl who had the Smurf doll, brought it to the assembly hall, and right in the middle of the meeting, the Smurf got up and made a nasty, vulgar remark and walked out of the meeting under his own power. And we're all laughing, and these stories seem funny to us, and yet Smurf toys were being thrown out by Jehovah's Witness kids by the droves. Uh, and it's, it, it serves to illustrate the fear that the average Jehovah's Witness lives under when it comes to the demonic, what a large part the occult plays in their lives. Well, if we look at the Watchtower's record, we find pagan symbols, astrology, phrenology, pyramidology, necromancy, false prophecy, consulting of spirits, subliminal images. The question I got to ask, can this organization possibly, possibly be of God? This organization has touched the unclean thing. And remember, most Jehovah's Witnesses don't know anything about this. They'd be shocked to find out about it. Some might even be so shocked that their faith in the organization would be shaken and they might come out. But remember, if you try to present this to them, that the Watchtower teaches them that any organization, any uh, information that opposes the organization is automatically a lie by default. They are correct about certain things though. God does forbid his people to become involved in occult practices. They would quote Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 13 to you, where it says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Jehovah's Witnesses today would agree with this. However, the history of their organization shows that they have not been faithful to God in this area. We are assured that Christians, real Christians, do not need to fear the demonic. 1 John 4, 4 says, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Christ Jesus is in me and he's greater than the one that's in the world. Amen. Satan may be allowed to test and tempt us, but there's a problem for Jehovah's Witnesses, and that's that they're not followers of the real Jesus Christ. They're followers of an organization, they're followers of men. They do not have Christ in them, and therefore their fear is justified. As every one of us once was, they're lost sinners in need of a savior. And I should probably mention at this point, it's not just Jehovah's Witnesses who need a Savior. Every one of us does. 
I hope that everyone here, everyone in this room has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that you have Christ Jesus in you. I hope that no one here fails the test. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? I hope you don't. But if you do, you need to know that Jesus is very near. He died for your sins, and he wants to give you eternal life as a free gift if only you will accept the gift. You can come to know him right here, right now. You can walk out of this room tonight and go down to the dinner hall knowing that Christ is in you and that you pass the test. We are assured in the Bible that to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I am not going to ask uh, for you to close your eyes or a show of hands or anybody to come to the front of the auditorium here. I just want you to think in your heart, sincerely evaluate your situation with the Lord and invite him into your life if you haven't already done that. And if you don't feel like you know how to do that, please talk to someone. Talk to me, talk to Joan, talk to anybody. Who, in all these ministries here, all these Christians in this room, there are plenty of people here who know Jesus as their personal Savior, as their Lord, and we would love the opportunity to introduce you to him. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Once again, Lord, we thank you for this uh, hour and for this uh, convention and, and for all the wonderful privileges you give us as your people, for everything that, we, that, that you do and the, and the glory that you bring yourself through uh, our works and, and through the works of those who love you and serve you throughout the world. We pray that everyone here passes the test and that the, the Holy Spirit can use some of this information that's been presented to open, closed minds of Jehovah's Witnesses and, and that uh, Jesus' word may penetrate the hearts of those who have been deceived. We pray for your blessing in all that we do, and we pray for your blessing on the remainder of this convention, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Thank you.